afternoon, students, and welcome back to another episode of Ant 200, Introduction to Archaeology. Today, we are starting a little bit deeper dive into the economic processes underlying one of the most prevalent and mind-altering industries in the ancient Mediterranean. That is, of course, the winemaking industry. So as a refresher from our last lecture, the origins of wine production are actually nowhere near the old heart of the Roman Empire. Instead, we need to travel eastward to China, where a team of archaeologists discovered the earliest evidence for wine at the site of Jihao in 1995. The site dates back to around 7000 BC, and there we have evidence for ceramic vessels that contained a variety of alcoholic beverages, rice wine and mead, and most importantly for us today, grape wine. Our earliest evidence for actual straight up grapes only wine comes from Georgia. Our evidence of wine from Georgia also comes in the form of chemical analyses. And here we think the wine was drank straight and unmixed, much like our wine today. While the Mediterranean may not have the oldest wine, today Italy and the Roman Empire are often the first things we think about in terms of ancient wine production. Up until about a year ago, most scholars thought that wine production in Italy started somewhere during the Middle Bronze Age, roughly about 1300 BC. But recent excavations at Mount Cronio near Argento on the island of Sicily has turned up possible evidence of much older wine storage. Chemical analyses of the Copper Age storage jars dating to roughly the 4th century fourth millennia BC show evidence of tartaric acid and sodium salt, both of which could indicate the presence of wine. While there's still much research that needs to be done in order to verify the Mount Cronio findings, what we do know is that winemaking in Italy predated the founding of Rome. And the Etruscan culture, the advanced precursor to Roman culture, located in primarily the region of Tuscany, commonly grew grapes and made wine. We can see the archaeological remnants of how important wine was in the fine Etruscan pottery, like the one displayed behind me. These are called craters, or wine mixing bowls, and they're left behind as burial goods in many Etruscan tombs. The oldest texts we have about Roman wine production come not from Rome, but from the city of Carthage in North Africa. This text was written by Mago prior to Rome's sack of the city in 146 BC. Mago's work was one of the few Carthaginian texts that survived the Punic Wars, and Roman writers thereafter used his treaties as a basis for their own works on viticulture. While we don't have Mago's work it left itself, we do have snippets of it in Greek and Latin sources from authors who drew upon his work. The Romans also had their fair share of writers who discussed how to successfully grow and harvest grapes and turn that harvest into wine. The first and arguably most influential was Cato the Elder. Cato was a Roman senator, a provincial governor and a harsh opponent of Carthage. One of his most famous works was called De Agricultura, concerning the culture of the field, or more simply, concerning agriculture. Cato's De Agricultura is a treatise on how to run a farm, what to grow, when to grow, where to grow, and how to staff the farm, as well as how to get the most out of all of your workers. There are two historical insights into wine production within Cato's work. First, the Romans valued agriculture as the most esteemed and respectable of professions. Rich Romans could have put their money into industry or commerce or banking to make money, but Cato makes it clear that agriculture is what you do if you want to truly be part of the respectable classes. The second big insight from Cato's writing is that there's a kind of move away from subsistence farming towards cash cropping during the time he was writing. Subsistence farming is when you grow basically everything you need, some grain to eat, olives for olive oil, grapes for wine, and you raise some livestock for meat and milk. While this might be a good system at an individual or family level, it's not great once you try to scale it up. 
If your land is best for growing olives and you can only dedicate 10% of your land to olive trees, the rest is going to other crops and you're not making the most of the land that you have. Cash cropping is when you specialize in the one thing that your land is best for. And Cato mentions that during his time, specializing in vineyards was a really good idea because of how much money you can make from the winemaking process. The rise of large specialized farms during the second century BC were known in Latin as latifundia. Just like on plantations in 18th century North America, latifundia tended to specialize in a single crop that brought in the most money. And just like plantations, they were often driven in large part by slave labor. Unlike in the Americas, slavery in ancient Rome wasn't based on race. Rather, slaves could be anyone who was defeated in battle or bought or sold for, from another person. The division was far more about being Roman or not Roman, rather than being black or white, indigenous or otherwise. From the Punic Wars on, slaves were pouring into Italy because of the massive battles Rome was winning across the Mediterranean. These slaves often ended up on latifundia farming and working on vineyards, and this had a major cultural impact. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the type of farms that were used to produce grapes and wine in ancient Rome, but where exactly were these farms? In the early days of Roman wine cultivation, the Roman people wanted to keep the substantial profits from winemaking all to themselves. Shortly after Cato the Elder wrote De Agricultura, Rome legally banned the cultivation of wines north of the Alps. So you could no longer grow grapes in places like modern day Germany or Switzerland or even France. And this allowed Rome to reap the monetary benefits of the export of wine to those regions. By concentrating production within Italy, the Roman Empire was able to export wine at a profit and then use the money to purchase slaves so that they could grow more grapes, make more wine and make more profit. As Roman power expanded across the Mediterranean into Spain and beyond the Alps into France, so did the production of wine. During the late Republic and early Roman Empire, the expansion of Roman power led to grape growing and winemaking in most of the areas we now consider famous for their high quality wines. Bordeaux and Burgundy and the Rhone Valley in France, the Rioja region in Spain, the Mosul Valley in Germany. Eventually, Italy got so populated that the Emperor D Domitian in 92 AD decreed it illegal to plant huge vineyards in Italy. Instead, everyone had to grow less profitable grain. So what types of wine were Romans drinking? Well, one of the most popular wines throughout the empire was known as Laura. Laura was a bittersweet wine-like drink that was made from the leftover grape skins and stems after the initial winemaking process. This would be left to ferment, and then the rather unappealing beverage could be served to slaves or soldiers or the poor. While some wines like Laura were meant to be drunk quickly, with the others like highly prized Kea Kuban were meant to be preserved or aged. Keisha Kuban was renowned in antiquity as being the best wine ever. Dio, Dioscorides says it tastes sweet and Athenaeus tells us how it only reaches full mature flavor after many years. Despite Kesebium's claims as the greatest wine in ancient Rome, it was Falerian wine that received the most praise in ancient Roman literature. It was made in the, um, um, from the Ammonian grape, and the vines were said to have been brought to Italy by Greek colonists settling near Cumae. Just like Kea Cuban, uh, Falerian, Falernarian wine was thought to be, get better with age, sometimes aging for up to 20 years in the clay amphorae used for wine storage in ancient Rome, which actually turned the white wine an amber or brown color. At the famous town of Pompeii, we can see how Falerian stands out against other varietals. Some graffiti on the walls of Pompeii show the prices in poetic form of wine at a local bar. For example, it states that for one, 
ass, you can drink wine. For two, you can drink the best wine. And for four, you can drink valerian. And just like today, some vintages of wine became absolutely legendary. Like a 1787 Chateau Lafitte or an 1869 Chateau Margaux, the Opiemian vintage of Valerian wine was so impressive that it was talked about for hundreds of years. The name of the vintage came from the consul of the year it, the consul of the year it was produced, Lucius Opiumus, consul of 121 BC. 200 years later, the ancient historian Pliny was still writing about this vintage, saying that some families had stored it for centuries. Pliny also noted that the, that the taste and texture left something to be desired, saying it was reduced to the consistency of honey with a rough flavor. Interestingly, this change in taste and texture over centuries is also what seems to happen to French wines from the 18th century when they're opened today. One of the main takeaways from our lecture so far is the sheer amount of wine that was being transported across the Mediterranean. Roman historian David Potter suggests something like 100 million liters of wine was headed into Rome each year. And that's just one city in an empire that spans the entire Mediterranean. Most estimates suggest that the average Roman was drinking somewhere around one liter of wine per day. So how in the world do you become the greatest empire the world has seen if everyone in the empire is drowning themselves in wine? Well, one of the major practices the Roman, Romans borrowed from the Greeks was a process of diluting wine. Roman wine started out generally more alcoholic than our modern version, something closer to 16 rather than 13%. To lower the alcohol content and prevent or at least slow down drunkenness, the Romans would mix roughly three parts of water for every one part wine. So the final product, alcohol-wise, would be something more like a light beer today, something more around 4%. We can see this process of mixing wine both in the archaeological record and in the historical documents. Archaeologically, we have sculptural reliefs that show the process of wine being poured from an amphora into a crater to be mixed with water. We also have the craters themselves that would have been used for such purposes. In the textual record, the author Diodorus Siculius describes how the Gauls, considered barbarians by the Romans, drank wine unmixed, implying that it was characteristic of barbarians. As we touched on in the last lecture, the, the aristocracy of Rome imbibed at social gatherings known as a convivium. The Latin word convivium literally means living together. Like the Greek symposium, the convivium took place at the residence of an elite member of Roman society. Most elite houses were centered on an area known as the atrium, an open area that served to connect other specialized parts of the house. In the middle of the atrium was a small pool, the impluvium, into which rainwater could fall through an opening in the ceiling. The atrium would have been a fairly public part of the house where friends, families, and clients of the head of household could have mingled while awaiting their business with the boss. Located around the atrium were a variety of room types. The tablurium, basically the office of the boss, often stood at the rear of the atrium. And from here, he called clients and partners in to address business concerns. Behind the atrium was usually the peristyle, a, colonnade, a, a colonnaded courtyard used to allow light and air into the home, as well as to provide a nice place for the family to perambulate at their leisure. The triclinium is the most important room for our discussion today, however, and was located off to the side of the atrium or garden. Very literally, the triclinium means the three couch room, composed of couches lining the walls where guests would recline to sip wine and nibble on food. The couches formed a U-shape, and in the middle of the U was a large table that would have held all the food for the feast. As shown here, the triclinium was often richly decorated with frescoed walls, mosaic floors, marbled and bronze statues. And here, within the triclinium, the conivium would go down. 
there were usually at least three courses, appetizers, the main course, and the dessert. Aristocratic hosts would often try to provide exotic wild animals, fish, and birds in order to impress their guests with the rarity and high cost of the ingredients. Those rare foods could be pheasants or songbirds, shellfish like oysters and lobsters, and even things we don't think of as, as really food today, like eels or peacocks. As important as the type of food served were the platters, cups, and utensils used to serve it. Most wealthy homes would have had a set of literal silverware. Wine was just as big a part of the Roman convivium as the Greek symposium. Unlike the symposium, however, it was usually individually mixed for each attendee. They'd ladle out the unmixed wine into their cups and then mix in whatever they like, sometimes boiled water, other times ice, other times just regular water, and sometimes even spices and honey. The wine would have been drunk out of a specialized wine cup called the skiffos and the canatheros. The skiffos was a, a kind of short, deep wine cup with two handles, while the canatheros was a similar deep wine cup with two handles and a longer stand. The wealthiest families would have had silver skifos and cantharos with ornate reliefs often relating to Bacchus, the Roman god of wine. One final big difference between Greek symposia is that the convivium in Roman times wasn't limited to just men. Elite women could attend as well, and sometimes even the children of the household could attend, giving them a chance to learn how to become a respectable man within elite Roman society. Even those of the lower classes were sometimes invited to join the elite at the convivium. Roman social structure was built in part on what is known as patron-client relationships, where wealthy aristocrats served as patrons, providing money and jobs and favors to their clients. The poorer people who took advantage of those favors the poor people took advantage of those favors. In return, the clients would vote the way the patron wanted, and they would support the patron out of public. And in times, and at times, they joined the patron at his convivium, both as a reward to the client and a way to boost numbers at the party. In this sense, the convivium was more than just a party to drink wine. At. It was an important aristocratic institution that built social bonds among the elite and gave them an opportunity to impress their peers and win status among them. Obviously, not everyone had the means or the status to put on elaborate convivia. Nonetheless, they still had plenty of wine to drink, often with their lunch and dinner at home or at bars. At home, less wealthy families would have had a similar set of utensils and tableware, but they would have been made out of cheaper materials, most often a deep red ceramic. Known as terra sigliata, or stamped earth, this form of pottery produced a shiny red color because the high temperature of the kilns semi-vitrified, or basically semi-liquefied, the clay itself. The fact that decoration was stamped rather than painted was also classically Roman. You can imagine how much more efficiently this could be produced. And indeed, in the provinces of Rome, especially Gaul, it grew nearly to the level of mass production. At nearly all meals, regardless of status, wine would have been present. This was because wine was served as a way to reduce the bacteria that could commonly be found in the untreated water of the time. Even slaves were expected to take part in the drinking of wine. Cato the Elder suggests that slaves should get five liters of wine per day. Uh, sorry, five liters of wine per week. <laughs> That's about seven modern bottles of wine, even though he justifies this by saying it will help with their health rather than their enjoyment of life. Slaves would have primarily drunk Laura, the wine-like beverage made from the third pressing of the grape skins and stems, certainly the lowest type of wine we know of from the Roman world. Soldiers too were allotted a liter of wine a day, and this was thought to help them both physically and mentally. Wine was also inextricably bound to religion and ritual in, ancient, in the ancient Roman world. 
Wine was of a, a kind of centerpiece to festivals, both for common consumption, but also for official sacrifice to the gods being honored. Moreover, wine was commonly linked to the idea of rebirth. The Roman god Bacchus, similar to the Greek god Dionysus, is frequently associated with ideas of life after death. We also see wine playing a role in medicine in the ancient Roman world. Ancient doctors used wine as both an antiseptic and as a pain reliever. With its relatively high content of alcohol, wine would, have made, would make sense for both of these purposes. Other uses were a bit more odd. One doctor reportedly used wine as a laxative by mixing it with manure and ashes and the plant hellebore. Other recipes had juniper and myrtle mixed with wine in order to cure snake bites. Still others could be related to mental disorders like depression and physical problems like gout or bloating. On the whole, we can see wine as something of a democratizing beverage, basically something that made people more equal. Although there were different types of wine, the beverage was available to people regardless of class or gender. Women and men, slave and free, rich and poor, could all take part in drinking of wine in the ancient Roman world. And when you combine that cultural approach with the fact that it was fairly diluted and that it helped purify the water, it starts to make sense how the Romans were able to drink about a liter of wine a day per person. With wine being tied to social relations and religious ritual, as well as military service and health and well being, it's at least a little easier to understand how these massive quantities were consumed. And it's easier to get a sense for how a simple beverage played a huge role in molding Roman society to the way it was. <laughs>